Hello, everybody, and welcome to the presentation. Today, I'll be presenting on confidently presenting your quantitative results. My name is Vanessa. I'm a qualitative and quantitative mentor here at Statistics Solutions. So just before we get started, I just wanted to share some um, resources for you all. Sierra on the call has also posted them in the chat. Um, so we are a dissertation consulting company. We provide assistance with the dissertation all the way from the beginning stages through defense. So if you're someone who feels that you might benefit from our services, or if after this uh, presentation today, you think that you might benefit from a more one-on-one -on -one experience, uh, please feel free to refer to the links in the chat. And we'll go ahead and get started. Also for being here today, you'll all receive a copy of these slides as well as a recording after the webinar is over. So just to give you an overview of what we'll be discussing today, we will be talking about the quantitative results chapter. So we won't be covering any methods related to qualitative or mixed studies, but we do have other webinars that are more geared towards those types of um, research studies. So if you're interested in those, um, we do have a webinar archive library available on our website, so you can check that out. So today I'm going to talk about the purpose and the importance of the results chapter. And then we'll talk about the different components, um, including the introduction, data collection, descriptive statistics, assumptions testing, um, and then answering the research questions. Then at the end of the presentation today, um, we'll open up the opportunity for question and answer. So if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the chat or to put them in the Q, uh, Q a box and I'll do my best to answer those at the end. If you do have specific questions to your research study, like if you're wondering uh, what specific research design to use or anything like that, I do recommend you reach out for a more one-on-one -on -one session for those types of questions, just because in order to give you a really clear answer, it's important that I kind of know a lot about your study. Um, so for those types of things, I think it's helpful to really reach out one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. But just to get us started here, let's first talk about the purpose of the results chapter. So the purpose of this chapter is to present the data analyses conducted to answer your research questions and hypothesis. So the previous chapters of the dissertation, namely the introduction, literature review, and methodology chapters, um, set up the why and how of your research. So it sets up why your research is important, why you're conducting it, and then how you're going to conduct it. So by the time you get to the results chapter, you will already have collected your data, you would have already um, have conducted your study, and you've already run your analysis. So here we're going to be presenting those findings um, to really show the reader what you found in your research. So in this chapter, you will be answering your research questions that you have already previously stated in previous chapters. So by the end of this chapter, the reader would have a clear picture of the presented findings um, and the different hypotheses and a clear statement to answer each of them. So for example, if your study has five research questions, by the end of the results chapter, um, you should have an answer to each of those five research questions. You'll want to save further interpretation of those findings for the discussion chapter. So you don't want to provide any implications or um, you know, further thoughts on your results here in this um, results chapter, because that will go in the next chapter, which will be the discussion. It's also worth noting that although today I'm going to be covering the results or the different sections of the results chapter, um, if you have a checklist or a template provided by your school or your chair, I always recommend referring to that as a good starting place because at the end of the day, they're gonna sign off on your dissertation. So you wanna make sure that you're including all of the information that they require 
if you don't have a checklist, this presentation is a really good starting point. Um, this is just a general kind of compilation of what we've seen most schools require. But again, some places may differ. So I'll always refer you to your school's guidelines. Okay, so now let's talk about the introduction. So you can start off the introduction section typically by restating the purpose of the study and restating your research questions and hypotheses, and then providing an outline of what the chapter will contain. So when you restate your purpose of the study, this is something that you would have already done earlier on in different chapters, so you can pretty much pull from there. It can be done either verbatim or it can be a short summary of what you've already stated earlier. Um, and this is just important because it sets up the reader for, um, you know, just a reminder of what the purpose is. So you're kind of looking back, reminding them what you've already discussed and looking forward by outlining what you'll be talking about in the chapter to come. And then for your research questions, it's really important to note that these are always um, restated verbatim. So whatever you wrote your research questions were earlier in chapters, you want to copy and paste those each time you reference them just to ensure that you're being consistent and providing clarity to the reader on what your research questions are. So those are not an area that you wanna get creative. It's good to just really restate them. The next section would usually be the data collection and preparation section. So here you want to summarize the data collection procedures that you followed and note any changes from your originally proposed data collection procedures. So this is important if anything changed between when you wrote up your proposal in your methodology chapter to when you actually collected your data. Because sometimes thing can, things can change in between, you know, whether you run into issues during data collection or whatever might happen um, from the point where you proposed to when you actually carried out the data collection. You just wanna lay that out here so that your reader understands where you deviated from your plan. Um, and what implications that may have for your results, whether you maybe uh, sampled from a different population than you originally intended or used a different sampling method, um, or maybe even changed a variable that you intended to measure originally. You just wanna make sure that you note all of that here. There can be a number of reasons why some things might change in between um, your original proposal to data collection. Um, and that's fine, but it's just important to make sure that you're noting them. So uh, just going through a few examples, there are a number of ways um, that you can go about doing this. And some schools have different preferred methods. So sometimes schools will just want you to discuss the changes in the results chapters, whereas other schools may want you to go back and revise your methodology chapter to reflect what you actually did. So this is another case where you just wanna make sure you're following your school specific instructions on how to handle changes in your procedures. In this section, um, you'll also want to discuss, so in addition to discussing changes, you'll also want to talk about the results of your data collection. So how many participants did you end up getting from your study? Uh, what was your response rate? And you want to also discuss any attrition in your sample. So you'll want to discuss things like the total number of responses you received. Um, so if you're doing something like a simple survey study, you want to make sure to outline how many people answered your study. And then you'll want to talk about if you have to remove any participants from your study and then the reasons that you're removing them. So do you have to remove or exclude any responses? And if you do, how many are you removing? Um, and then also, why did you remove them? So that may be that those participants didn't meet your inclusion criteria. Uh, in that case, you just want to make that clear here. So you may want to talk about your inclusion and exclusion criteria 
um, just to provide context for the reader as to why certain participants either met that criteria or didn't. You may also have to exclude participants for things like missing data, especially if you're doing something like a survey study or an online survey. Um, it's very likely that you'll get respondents that either skip questions or they stop taking the survey in the middle or, you know, whatever the case may be. If you do get incomplete responses, you'll have to deal with that missing data in some way. So here you'll have to talk about any participants um, that you'll be excluding for that. Then once you talk about all of the exclusions, you'll want to state your final total sample size. And if necessary, you may want to um, discuss a post hoc power analysis if you didn't meet the sample size requirement that you set out in your proposal. So usually in your proposal in the methodology chapter, you would do a power analysis for a quantitative study just to determine um, the number of participants or the sample side that's needed for your study. And if you don't meet that sample size, your school or your committee may require you to do this post hoc power analysis to determine the statistical power of your study with the sample that you had actually obtained. Also in this section, you want to discuss any preliminary data preparation steps before you do your analyses. So this can involve a number of things such as checking data for accuracy. This is especially important if you are doing something like an in-person survey where participants are filling out the survey on like paper and pen. You just want to provide some information here about how you're ensuring um, that the data being entered into whatever system that you'll use for analysis is being entered accurately and correctly. You'll most likely have to have um, some plan for handling missing data, as I mentioned before, and it's very likely that you'll have um, missing or incomplete responses if you do have some sort of paper and pen survey. So here you'll just want to talk about how you're going to handle the participants whose data are missing. So some ways that you might handle that are you could completely exclude the participants like we've talked about, or um, Sorry, I just saw the chat pop up. I will answer that at the end. Um, or you could um, impute the values that are missing. You could use a mean. Um, so whatever it is that you plan to do, you'll just need to make that clear here. You'll also want to have some sort of plan for those different procedures. So if you're using a mean replacement or if you're going to do some type of imputation, you'll just want to describe that here as well. Um, you may also do things in your initial uh, data cleaning process, like check for outliers. So if you're doing that, you'll want to discuss that. Um, another common thing I've seen is recoding data. So if you need to score certain instruments differently, you'll just want to discuss that as well. So for example, if you're doing a survey that's related to depression scores, and maybe you have a Likert scale, from one to seven, and you want to look at the scores inversely, and you may need to recode that data, this is where you'll describe that process. In this section, you can also describe um, the scoring of the data instruments or any coding of the data that you need to do to prepare it for analysis. So one example of this might be if you have a survey question, um, an example that I always use is, if you're looking at maybe length of maternity leave and you have two questions and one is, did you take paid maternity leave? And the other is, did you take unpaid maternity leave? If you're wanting to just get a general um, figure of total or how many weeks, how many weeks of maternity leave were taken, you may need to combine these questions. So you may need to write some syntax to create um, one question that adds both of these variables together. So if that's the case, you'll wanna discuss any transformations to the data here in this step. So now we're gonna take a look at some examples of what you might write in this data collection and preparation section. 
So here we have an example where we first state the total number of survey responses that we received. So we've got 485 surveys. And then we talk about how we need to exclude some participants. So for instance, participants who were missing more than 50% of questions, um, then we state our final total sample and also have a statement about how we're handling any remaining missing values or responses. And again, you will all have copies of these slides. So if you'd like to refer back to these examples, you'll be able to. Here is another example of an excerpt from the section that has a little bit more information. So here we have more information about when the data collection took place. Again, we state the total number of participants that responded. And then we go into detail about participants who were excluded for various reasons. So whether they didn't agree to the informed consent or they had a certain amount of responses missing or didn't meet the inclusion criteria for our study. And then at the end, we again state our final total sample size that we used for the analysis. So again, just really painting that clear picture for the reader, giving them step by step so they see what process you went through um, before getting to the analysis step. Here is an example um, that you might write up for a post hoc power analysis. So I know there's a question in the chat about this. Okay, this example doesn't answer that question just yet, so we will get to it. Um, but if you didn't meet your target sample size or if you didn't get statistically significant results, you may be required to do a post hoc power analysis. So here we're stating that we're doing the post hoc power analysis and then we're stating the statistical tests that we're doing um, for that test. So in this case, we're doing a t-test and a regression. And for each test that you're doing the post hoc power analysis for, you want to state what your sample size was. So our group sizes for our t-test and our sample size for our multiple linear regression and state the level of power that was obtained for each test. So after you've discussed the information about your data collection and your data preparation procedures, you can start getting into your descriptive statistics. So in this section, you want to provide descriptives for the demographic variables in your study and all of the variables of interest. In this case, the variables of interest would be any of the variables that are included in your research questions and hypotheses. So the actual variables that you plan on testing. So you'll want to provide things like frequencies and percentages for any categorical variables. Um, so this can include things like gender or ethnicity. You want to include the frequencies and percentages for those. And then for continuous variables, you'll want to provide means and standard deviations. So if you are looking at age or GPA or weight, those are variables that you might um, provide a mean and standard deviation for. If possible, you'll want to compare the demographic characteristics of your sample to the population so that the reader can have an idea of how representative your sample is. So if you do have population statistics, for instance, for things like breakdowns of gender, um, or ethnicity in the general population, you'll want to compare those breakdowns with your sample um, to show the reader how close your sample is to those numbers. So this will tell them, you know, did you roughly get the same proportion of men and women in your sample as there are in the population? Or did it, was it different? Did it deviate from that kind of normal distribution? And another thing you may want to present in the descriptives is reliability coefficients. So this is usually done um, using the Cronbach's alpha for any measures where reliability is, apl is applicable. So this would mainly be things like survey instruments that have multiple items. So for instance, if you're using a survey instrument to measure self-esteem and it has 10 questions, you may need to run the Cronbach's on all 10 of those questions to make sure that the instrument is reliable in your sample. <laughs> 
So we will go through a few more examples. So here are some excerpts to show you how you might present the descriptive statistics. So in this example, we're showing a breakdown of our categorical variables. So you might present a table that shows frequencies and percentages for any categorical or nominal variables, as well as we're providing some narrative to describe what's in the table. Anytime that you have a table in your dissertation, it's important to make sure that you are providing a narrative. Um, it can be brief, but you just wanna make sure that the reader isn't kind of just happening upon a table. You do wanna provide a little bit of context before they get to that table. One thing that's important to note as you present your results um, in relation to the narrative text is that first you want to make sure that any table that you put in the document is referred to in the text. So you can say something like, our demographic characteristics are displayed in table one. Um, and that again, it's just getting back to that reference piece and making sure that you're kind of painting a really clear picture for your reader and there's some context for these. Um, these figures and tables that you're going to be entering. Usually the table should appear immediately following that text in which it's referenced. So I don't recommend kind of grouping all of your tables together towards the end. I do recommend popping it in underneath the paragraph where you're talking about it. And again, that's just going to make it easier for your reader to follow along with what you're describing in the narrative portion. And then here's another example of how you might present a table containing descriptive statistics for continuous variables. So in this table, we're providing the minimum, the maximum values, as well as the mean and standard deviation. In this example, um, this is how you might present a table for Cronbach's alpha reliability coefficients. So you may want to present the number of items and the Cronbach's alpha coefficient for each of the instruments that were used in your study. After you go through all of your descriptives, it's time to start getting into discussion of the main analyses that you are doing to answer your research questions. But before you can do that, you need to talk about the assumptions of those analyses. So essentially all inferential statistics that you do um, that would be used to answer your research questions would have some sort of statistical assumptions associated with those tests. So for instance, if you're doing something like a t-test, some assumptions include testing for normality and homogeneity of variance. And different statistical tests will have different assumptions required for those tests. So before you present the results of your test, you need to talk about the testing of the assumptions for each of those tests. So I know it sounds like a lot of tests, but basically you wanna show the reader that you know what's required in order to conduct a test and that you looked for that and ensured that your sample um, would be appropriate for that specific test that you've selected. So you may wanna have a section before you get into your results that talks specifically about assumptions testing. And again, different schools will have different requirements or suggestions for how to organize this. Sometimes they want you to present the assumptions just all in their own section, or it may also be acceptable to pr just present them um, for each test as you present that test. But regardless, um, for each test that you're doing, you will want to list and discuss the required assumptions for that test um, for that particular analysis. So you want to list those out. Uh, for instance, if you're doing a t-test or an ANOVA, you may need to do assumptions testing for normality and homogeneity of variance. So you'll want to state how each assumption is tested so going along with that example, uh, how do you plan to test normality? So you have a few options. Are you going to be looking at a histogram? Are you going to be conducting a Shapiro-Wilkes test? Are you going to be looking at the skewness and kurtosis values? Um, or will you use a different method? So whatever it is, you just want to state exactly what the assumption that you're testing is and then what you're doing to test it. 
you'll want a clear statement about whether or not the assumption is met. So if you are testing for normality, you state the assumption normality was met or the assumption normality was not met. And then you want to describe any action taken if the assumption isn't met. So if you find that the assumption of normality is violated, what are you gonna do about that? Are you going to try to transform the data or the variables to make sure um, to kind of manipulate the data in a way to make it normal? Um, or are you going to try to remove outliers that are causing the data to be non-normal? Or another um, potential solution or alternative is to just run an alternative test. So like if you were doing a t-test instead, um, maybe you decide that you're not going to do a parametric test. So you're instead going to pivot and do something that does not require that normality assumption to be met. So if you do have any violations of assumptions, you want to talk about how you're responding to those violations. And again, I, you know, just disclaimer as always, depending on how your school wants that to be presented, just make sure that you are presenting that information in the correct place. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples of how we might present the results of assumptions testing. So here in this example, we are testing normality and we're doing it by presenting a normal probability plot. And we state here that normality was tested by inspection of this normal PP plot. We present the plot in a figure and then we state that the data showed no significant deviation from the normal line. So here we can interpret that. Um, so here we can interpret what's in the plot. So we're stating the results of the test and then we're giving an indication of whether the assumption was met or not. So in this case, the assumption is met because the data appeared to follow the normal line. So here is another example of how you might write up an assumptions test. So in this case, we have an example where one of our assumptions is violated. So we can see here that we do a test for outliers. We say how we're testing for outliers. Uh, we do it by looking at standardized values. Here, we're also stating that we do observe an outlier in our data. And we say that we're going to exclude this outlier from our analysis. Um, so we state how we're dealing with the violation of the assumption. So again, these are just some potential alternative methods if you do have a violation. So once you've done all of that, um, it's finally time to present the results. So we've kind of just been setting up the reader to see, um, we already talked about why our study is important, how we're conducting our study, we talked about our data collection, we talked about our sample, our population, the type of test we wanted to run, and now we can finally get to the point and talk about what our results are. So you'll want to organize this section by research question if possible. So again, if you have five research, research questions, you'll just want to go in order of research question one through five. You don't want to jump around and start with like research question two and then go to four um, and then back to one. You really just want to follow them in order um, just for clarity for your reader. And similar to your data collection procedures, if there are any changes from your originally proposed data analysis procedures, you wanna discuss those in this section. Especially if you did have any changes um, to the data collection procedures, it's possible that those changes may have also impacted the types of analyses that you're able to do. So if um, that's appropriate for you, you'll want to discuss that here. And you'll just want to justify the new data analysis um, process that you ended up following in your results chapter. So again, it's okay if you deviate, but it's just important to justify that and provide some rationale for why you did. Now for each analysis, you'll want to clearly identify the variables that are used. So if you're doing something like a t-test or an ANOVA, you want to clearly identify your independent and dependent variables. 
If you're doing a correlational analysis like a regression, you want to identify your predictor variables, um, your criterion variable, and any covariates that you included in your analysis. You'll want to provide appropriate statistics associated with each test. So most tests will have p-values. You may also want to report effect sizes associated with those tests, as well as confidence intervals um, and test, test statistics that correspond with the tests. So if you're doing a t-test, you may want to present the t-statistic and the degrees of freedom. If you're doing an ANOVA, you'll report the f-statistic and the degrees of freedom and so on. Um, and these are all uh, pretty standard. If you were to look on like the SPSS website or the SAS website, you can find write-ups or sample write-ups for what test statistics you want to report uh, for each test. If your analysis requires any post hoc testing, then you'll want to present the results of those post hoc tests. So one example would be if you're doing an ANOVA and you find a significant result in your ANOVA, you may want to do a post hoc test to determine exactly um, the nature of the differences that you found in that original ANOVA. So in this case, you would want to report that post hoc testing. And importantly, this section should include clear statements that answer each research question and hypothesis based on the results of the analysis. So after you present the statistics for each analysis, you want to interpret those statistics and make a statement that answers your research question or hypotheses. So usually in a quantitative study, you may have your hypotheses written in the null and alternative format. And if that is the case, it's usually sufficient to make a statement about the null hypothesis. So you can say your null hypothesis was rejected if you found statistically significant results or that you failed to reject the null hypothesis if your results were not significant. So now let's look at some examples of how we might write up the results of a couple of commonly used tests. So this example here features a t-test. So we start by saying what analysis we're doing, an independent samples t-test was conducted. We state our independent and dependent variables. So in this case, we are looking at total score on the SAI based on gender. And then we show the results of the T test, including our test statistic with our degrees of freedom in parentheses. And we also um, note our p-value, which in this case is greater than 0.05. So that is the fourth line there, we've got our T statistic, um, 1.96, we have our degrees of freedom, 105, our p-value 0.052, and then we have our effect size, so 0.55. So in this case, again, um, our results are not statistically significant, and the measure of our effect size, um, which is Cohen's D, is reported. Then we make an interpretation of the statistics. So again, this is based on our p-value being greater than um, 0.05, so it's not significant. And then we state that the test is not significant. So really just drawing that straight line, presenting the numbers, interpreting, and providing a statement. So since we didn't find significance, we um, can make a statement about our hypothesis. So we say that the null hypothesis was not rejected. Then you might supplement this by displaying um, your table and also any uh, relevant statistics. So in this case, since this is an independent samples t-test, we are providing the uh, sample means for each of the samples that we're comparing. And we're also providing the standard deviation. So here's another example of a t-test, but this time our test is significant. So again, we state that we're doing a t-test. We state our independent and dependent um, values, and then we state that our test is significant. So again, this time our p-value is less than 0.05. So in this case, our p-value is 0 0.002. Alpha for this test is set at 0.05. So since our p-value is less, we can um, 
reject our null hypothesis and determine that our results are statistically significant. And again, we'll report uh, the sample means and standard deviations for each sample that was used in the analysis. I don't know if you guys realized you're gonna get a statistics lesson today, but I hope this is helpful. Um, so another example here, we have an ANOVA, so an analysis of variance. Again, we state what test we're doing. We state our independent and dependent variables. We present the results of the ANOVA, so the statistics associated with the ANOVA. In this case, um, we're gonna be presenting the F statistic. So just another note there that depending on what test you're doing, the test statistic that you report is different. So whereas in the T, we reported the T statistic, here in the ANOVA, we're going to be uh, reporting the F. And then you'll always have two values for degrees of freedom instead of one in this test. So the first value being the numerator degrees of freedom, the second value being the denominator degrees of freedom. We also have our p-value for our test. So in this case, our p-value is 0.555, which is greater than 0.05, and our alpha is set at 0.05. So in this test, we determine that it's not significant, and so we cannot reject the null hypothesis. And again, for this type of analysis, you might display some descriptive statistics for the means and standard deviations for the different groups that you're comparing in the ANOVA. Now, here is an example of how we might present the results of a correlational analysis. Here we actually are going to differ a little bit. We're going to restate our research questions first. And then we'll state that we've conducted a Pearson correlation. Um, and we state the variables that we're going to be using in the analysis. So just like we've done with the other two tests. And then we're going to present the Pearson's correlation coefficient. So that is our R, again, noting the different uh, notation for different tests. And then we'll also um, report the p-value that's associated with each correlation. So here we see uh, that we have our p-values that are less than 0.05. We've got 0 0.005, 0 0.006, and 0 0.002. And so since they are less than our um, alpha, we can reject our null hypothesis. So we will make a statement here to indicate that our null hypothesis is rejected. And then for the correlation analysis, you would want to report a table showing all of the correlations. Um, and if you're doing a correlational matrix, you will also want to show that so you could present these in a matrix. Now, this is an example of a regression analysis. So if you're doing a regression, you usually start by stating the results or significance of your overall regression model, which would be an F test. So again, we're going to state the F statistic and degrees of freedom, our p-value, and for a regression, we may also state the R squared, which is the percent of variance explained. If our regression is significant, um, our p-value is less than 0.05, our null hypothesis is rejected, and then usually for a regression analysis, you would present a table showing the individual predictors for the regression. So you might present them in a table like this where you show all of your predictors in the regression here and showing the results for each regression coefficient. And then you might interpret the regression coefficients that are significant in your model. So in this case, it looks like one of the variables in the regression here is significant and that is sex. And so we have some narrative in here to describe that significant regression coefficient. So we say sex was a significant positive predictor and then we provide the appropriate statistics. So once you've presented all of that information, all of the results to answer each of the research questions that you have listed out, you may want to end your results chapter with a summary. So you can either
summarize the entire contents of the results chapter or just summarize the answers to the specific research questions. In this section, you want to make sure that you restate the answer to each research question or hypothesis. So again, reiterating whether each null hypothesis was rejected or whether you failed to reject those null hypotheses. And then you'll just provide a transitioning statement to your next chapter to say that you will be discussing the meaning and the implications of these findings in the next chapter. So that brings us to the end of the presentation on the quantitative results chapter. Again, if you are interested in additional support outside of this webinar, you can use the information in the chat. Um, I'm sure we'll post that again in case um, anybody needs it. And we do offer a 30 minute consultation and it's completely complimentary. So if you are feeling like you need help, but you just really don't know where to start, that's a great place um, to begin. We can kind of hear about your research in depth. It's a, it's one-on-one, -on -one, so it's a little bit more um, interactive than this session and then determine really where where you need the most support. But that is the end of the presentation, so we can open it up to questions.